Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Bowl TV. My name is Matt Kenazar, and you have tuned in for another exciting episode of the Inside the OC podcast. We got the one man booth today, Aaron Smith, working on another project, but uh, we've got two great guests coming in to help us all prepare for the 2021 USBC Open Championships. That's right, just a couple of weeks away, opening day. Uh, this is our anniversary celebration, 50th episode of Inside the OC. Cannot wait to dig in and hear from, again, two experts in the field of preparation, Mike Calderon and Cortez Shank, Team USA member. They're coming to us from the B3 Performance Center in Arizona. Uh, we'll have all the details and some great advice on how you can get ready to become the next Eagle winner at the USBC Open Championships. Uh, without any further ado, that's uh, that's the cliche line, correct? Uh, as we get ready to bring in our guests, uh, but let's do that now. First, we'll start with Mike Calderon, and uh, and then we'll bring in Cortez for some expert advice as the show gets going. All right, Mike, welcome. Good afternoon, Matt. How are you? I am doing great. Welcome to Inside the OC. We are glad to have you here for this very special 50th episode of our podcast. That's it's a big deal. It's like getting close to my age. So that's okay. a it's a big deal. Thank you for having uh thank you for having me and and uh Cortez uh in the future. I'm sure here we'll chime in. Um but uh yeah, we're excited to uh, be here. Excited to know that Nationals is coming back and kicking back off again. So we're excited uh and can't wait to start seeing uh, all of our people from Arizona here in the in the West Coast start heading up to Vegas for uh, some bowling. Well, we missed so much in 2020, right? We, we've, we're just so used to the Open Championships being part of the annual landscape back to 1901, just a few years where we did not have OC competition. Uh, always a great time to welcome all of our friends and competitors uh, to the fantastic venues that we have. Of course, the South Point Bowling Plaza will play host in 2021 and 2022. Just down the road from you guys, you're in the Tempe, Phoenix area. Uh, so uh, really for, for anybody uh, who's going to want to maybe get a, a quick lesson or, or a couple tips on the way, uh, very possible. But uh, let's first start by catching up uh, with with you and uh, and who you are. Uh, I know you because we've been at this for, as you said, uh, you know, as, as old as we are now. We've been at this for a minute and we've seen you in various capacities, uh, whether it be as the pro shop guy in the Phoenix area or as a ball rep on the PWBA or PBA tours. Uh, out there lending your expertise uh, to help others succeed on the lanes. And, of course, we'll talk about your own success and, and your career at the OC. Of course, we have those numbers. But, uh, really, you have made a name for yourself helping other people excel on the lanes. So, first, give us a little bit of background on, uh, on who you are and kind of how things have developed for you, uh, growing from uh, you know the pro shop business to all that you've been able to, to travel and accomplish uh, to where we are right now in this awesome facility behind you, which we'll take a look at along the way too. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's been a long time uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of years uh, catching up out there. Obviously, with you, Matt, and and all the people and from USBC and all the places that we've been. But uh, yeah, started uh, 2002. Uh, luckily, uh, met Dave Wadka uh, with Ebony International and. Um, you know, kind of hung out with, with Dave and he kind of took me under his wing, uh, introduced me to a lot of people in, in the industry, uh, Ed Gallagher and, and a lot of the great people that were at EBI at the time. Um, and just kind of was a sponge. I, anybody that uh, had any information, I tried to listen to and, and try to take all the knowledge I could, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and that uh, kind of just led me down the path of working with some uh, great guys at the uh, TAT when Ebonite used to sponsor that um, and meeting a lot of people uh, with, you know, tournament experience as far as how tournament clubs work and and how they interact with groups, large groups and big, big money tournaments. Um, and then from that point on, I went to uh, did some with the youth uh, and I was out with the teen masters uh, and the start of junior gold when it kind of started back in Vegas um, a long time ago. Uh, so got to meet a lot of the young guys that are now out there at the World Series of Bowling right now, uh, the Wesley Lowe's and the A.J. Johnson's and those guys 
uh, and their families and still have connections with those guys. I and mean, Wesley's here pretty much all the time whenever he's uh, not out competing. Uh, so that's awesome. And I still keep in contact with uh, AJ and all the, the guys that I uh, knew growing up. Um, and then I moved on. Luckily, um, I worked uh, a few of the, for drilling wise, uh, for the women's uh, stops when they were first starting to come back. Uh, when the USBC did some of the stuff in Texas, uh, I drilled. Uh, Evan and I had me there drilling for some of the female pros there. Um, and Del Ballard, who was the Ebonite tour rep at the time, um, was changing uh, companies and going a different direction. And he put in a good word for me uh, at Ebonite saying that uh, Mike might be somebody to look at for uh, being out on tour just for relationship wise and um, kind of just the the information that I could uh, help them with, I guess, is what you would say. So uh, I started with the men's tour, which was a big step. That was uh, that was a huge step only because a lot of those guys I watched growing up and, uh, you know, wanted to emulate my game after them, the Chris Barnes and, uh, you know, Jason Couches and Mike Fagans and those guys that were just they, it, getting to work with them and try to help them out any way that I could was – was you know an honor and was great it was a big learning curve uh and i got a couple phone calls during my first uh i don't know maybe two months of doing it uh, most of it was positive uh, a few things i just uh you know that dell kind of helped me with that I, i'm indebted to dell ballard for uh, all of his knowledge uh him and chris schlemmer when chris was out there uh basically kind of molded my tour repping uh knowledge as far as how to talk to players and and kind of what advice to give and what advice not to give uh, at certain times. Uh, so I did that for seven years uh, on the men's tour, uh, a lot of World Series of Bowling, a lot of bowling centers, um, a lot of great like memories. Just, you know, when I look at some of the TV shows and they show like, you know, Pete Weber at the U.S. Open striking. Uh, you know, with the catchphrase of who do you think you are? I am like, I remember that I was there uh, and just the women's uh, in Reno when we were out in the street uh, and just okay. the, the behind the scenes stuff of that, which was a crazy event uh, leading up to actually the TV show, um, the Dallas Cowboys stadium. Uh, when Leanne won that, uh, that was just, I mean, just the places that got to go with that were unbelievable. Um, and then I went over to Europe for a while and I was in, I was Ebonite's European technical advisor for basically all things pro shop and uh, ball technology type of questions. So uh, I traveled around um, over there with the guys from Boltec. Uh, and that was interesting because I had never really been out of the country that much. Uh, I didn't bowl uh, on a tour overseas and stuff like that. So uh, that was interesting, just seeing the differences as far as where we are in the U.S. with technology and information and, you know, channels and outlooks uh, for people to see versus over there where they're just they're someplace are just starved for information. So um, that was a great time. And then in that whole time, I just kept thinking, how can I take this information and and partake it on to average people that, you know, don't get to go on bowl on tour and don't necessarily get to work with Del Ballard or Chris Schlemmer or, you know, guys that and girls at that level. Um, so it kind of just in one of the many 13 hour flights back home, it was one of those, what can we build in the desert that uh, hopefully people can uh, take advantage of and, and we can help uh, grow the sport. Well, now, so, Mike, I know we, we've both been able to surround ourselves with uh, the right people, right? The, the great people in this industry uh, who have helped us uh, come along to where we are and learn the things we have. And uh, and for you in Arizona, a lot of great bowling talent. Uh, you know, first ones that come to mind, of course, uh, uh, Shannon Pluhowski or uh, at the Open Championships, Dave Serigliano. And uh, you've been fortunate enough to take it one step further and you have married into Arizona bowling <laughs> royalty. Uh, and now you have the support uh, of that family as well. So uh, tell us about uh, that relationship. And, and of course, uh, we really know the, the boss and the brains behind this whole operation at B3. Uh, yes. And uh, so so tell us uh, kind of how that plays into your success, uh, both as a person and now uh, in the bowling industry. Yes. Uh, I mean, it was about uh, 
I'd say it was about 10 years ago. Uh, I got to meet, uh, luckily for me, on my end, uh, my lovely bride, who is uh, maiden name Brandy Wolf, uh, and now married name Brandy Calderon, hopefully forever. Uh, so, yeah, the, the name is synonymous with good bowling in that family, that's for sure. I mean, uh, Brandy was an All-American at ASU, um, you know, bowled collegiately, obviously at ASU, bowled a lot of the local stuff that there was here uh, against the likes of Shannon Plahowski, uh Amy Rocco was here. Uh, there's a lot of good talent that was uh, from Arizona. And then, you know, her brother uh, being the last uh, amateur to win the upcoming Masters events that we have uh, in the 2002 Masters, Brett Wolf. Uh, so it's uh, it's pretty cool to uh, be able to have my brother-in-law be uh, Brett and, you know, just kind of bounce ideas off of each other. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't get a chance to get on the lanes as much anymore. He has uh, three beautiful little ones now. So uh, he, uh, he's working on raising children at this point. And, uh, but he's, he's gearing back up to, uh, you know, and the facility here, he, he loves it because obviously he can just come here uh, whenever he really wants to come here uh, and, and bowl and, and kind of work on his game. And, um, you know, a lot of ideas I bounced off of, of him, of just things that he's seen over the course of all the years that he's bowled and all the tournaments that he's bowled at and, and bowling centers. So the family, I mean, their mom, Becky, I mean, everybody has just been great. And and really the the majority of the, the people in the Valley, like, I mean, I, I looked up to Dave Strigliano. I mean, he's got one of the longest running pro shops in the Valley here. So as far as pro shop uh, goes, I mean, he's done it right. Like you can't stay that long in the industry if you're not doing something right. So uh, I've looked up to Dave um, and we have a lot of great pro shop operators in the Valley. I mean, Arizona uh, has some good bowlers. Obviously we've had a lot of good bowlers that come out here, but uh, they've gotten a lot of help from a lot of great shops that have been around for a long time out here. So. All right. Well now over the next hour, uh, again, the goal today is to offer some advice on how bowlers of all skill levels can be successful at the upcoming USBC Open Championships. Uh, first day of competition, May 1st, just about eight weeks away. Uh, and then we'll run all the way until July 18th. So uh, a little bit of prep time for those bowling early yeah. uh, and some more time, of course, for those who will be joining us later in the event. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll use some of your expertise. And then again, we'll bring in Cortez Shank uh, to talk about what it takes to prepare for the event, whether it be practice or equipment or shooting spares and, and all those great things just in general. Uh, and then, of course, we'll talk about B3 here in just a minute uh, and what a facility uh, like that can offer, whether it be uh, with you guys uh, or a, a similar training center, the ITRC in Arlington, Texas, the home of Team USA, the Kegel Training Center in Florida, the Turbo Training Center in Michigan. So all over the country, there are great facilities with expert coaching and technology uh, but there's also things that bowlers can do at home on their own mm -hmm. within their home centers to get ready right any amount of work and preparation could only help find success on the biggest stage of bowling so first let's talk about the facility there behind you uh, looks like a, a great four lane setup uh, and something that was many years in the making for you right you said uh, i believe in, uh, in recent interviews uh, as things got rolling there that it was something that was that was in your mind for a long time uh, it was always in the name of what you were doing. And then it's how do we bring this to life, which you were able to do, uh, you know, which is hard work enough. And, and you were able to do that in the middle of a pandemic as well. So maybe <laughs> um, for what you guys do and, and the services that you offer, this has been a, a better time uh, because it's such a, an intimate environment uh, to be able to have that that one on one coaching and uh, social distancing and and all of those things. But uh, first, tell us a little bit about the facility and how it all came to be, especially during this crazy time in the world. Yeah, it's uh, you're 100 percent correct. I mean, originally uh, 2008, I opened the first shop uh, and it was full 300 pro shop and training center. And I remember for you know a couple of years there, it was, well, where's the training center? Where's the training center? And I said, well, you have to have knowledge and information before you can just open a training center. Uh, so I was at that time getting the knowledge that I, I thought that uh, would help me help bowlers uh, in the future. So uh, we kind of progressed uh, throughout the years. And, you know, like I said before, all the travels and all the people that I met and, you know, helping hands here and there with 
uh, the guys out at Kegel uh, and the TurboTech and ITRC uh, just started kind of formulating something that I kind of thought would be a nice size, um, not overly large uh, with a bunch of people, uh, but more, like you said, an intimate uh, type of uh, coaching and, and experience. So we do have four lanes. Uh, there are four Brunswick Pro Avalane uh, lane beds, uh, synthetic approaches. Uh, the, all the install was done by All-American uh, out of Pennsylvania. So anybody looking to putting lanes in, those guys are top notch. Um, but uh, yeah, we have, uh, like I said, Brunswick Pro Avalane. We have a Kegel Flex Walker uh, over my shoulder there. Um, and we have three high-speed cameras uh, on lane one that are similar to what was at lane 81 up at the plaza. Uh, so the three high-speed cameras all go into a computer that we can do overlays. So, uh, you know, if you came in and said, yeah, I want, I have a little bit of a hitch and we record it, we can overlay you with some of the best bowlers on the planet uh, that have stopped by and that will hopefully continue to stop by um, and or we can just go after six months if you've struggled and all of a sudden you bowled really really good and then you got back into a slump we could overlay you uh, over what you were doing when you were doing it correctly I guess or when you were not in a slump um, we also have torch XL which is a training device that helps uh, you focus on breakpoint as well as helps spare shooting uh, so breakpoint's a big thing especially at the open championships um, a lot of times I think people um, feel that the open championships are the pattern is impossible or uh, I, I never get to, I could never see that. They make them only uh, playable for good bowlers and it, all of that is really not true. It, it's it is a different uh, pattern, obviously, than what majority of house shots are going to give you. That is 100 percent true, uh, but it is playable. And I think that with more and more facilities like this and TurboTech and ITRC uh, and the ability for specialized training uh, in that, you would, it will become a much easier, uh, let's say it'll become much easier for you to go and get, be successful uh, at places like the Open Championships or USBC uh, Nash, uh, Nationals, or if you're gonna bowl like the Masters or the US Open, uh, places where it's premium for shot making. I mean, that's, that's what we want the sport to become. We want it to be where if you are a good shot maker, you're getting you know rewarded for making good shots. And I think if you just look back at the teams and the players that have bowled well over the course of the years at nationals, uh, th those are good players. Like they're, they're people that have honed their crafts, they practice their craft, uh, whether it be at a training facility across the country or their home facility, uh, but they work as a team, they get together as a team. And I think a lot of that is what nationals is really you know about so um you know the facility here we have the ability to put out uh the last uh nationals that we got to bowl uh 2019 uh we have that uh, loaded in the machine the singles and doubles and the team pattern uh we have put it out here uh we have bowled i have bowled on it a few times uh it plays pretty close to what i saw uh at south point um and we've tried to uh, incorporate the facility being as big as we can. Uh, a lot of times I think people go to Reno, uh, especially, or even South Point, and it's, they get on the approach and it's so massive. Uh, their name is in lights. Uh, it's big. Uh, the ceilings are tall. Uh, it's kind of loud in there uh, and it's not your environment. And I think that we tried as close as we can here uh, to make it an open environment. So you kind of get used to that more of a grander feel of bowling so that when you go and you walk out at Reno and you walk out at the plaza, you don't feel as nervous uh, being in such a big environment. Well, definitely some, some great points so far just about uh, the experience of being at the Open Championships, and we'll talk details and strategy here in a minute. But while we have a chance, uh, let's attempt to take a look at the facility <laughs> here. Uh, okay. B3, just to, to get an idea of, uh, of, you know, of what it's all about. And, uh, and what you guys can offer there. There's the four lanes behind you. You mentioned the Kegel Flex Lane Walker. The best yep. of the best. You guys absolutely did not skimp on getting this facility ready uh, to, to turn out some of the best players in the world. Some of you already mentioned. Um, just tell us about, again, there's, there's the four lanes, what we're seeing. Also, yep. uh, some unique uh, some pin setters there as well, something to, to focus on. And, um, Correct. You know, just tell us about some of the capabilities. And, and uh, yeah, as we look through these, uh, I believe we have four photos. And then we'll bring in Cortez. Um, yeah, so uh, on lane four, there to the right, that's Torch uh, that is turned on. 
um, just so people can kind of see what it looks like. Uh, and you can move torch uh, to the break point that you want uh, to help with the, you know, if you're going to do the P31 um, description of a pattern, you can kind of put it there. It gives you at least a starting point to kind of where you want your ball to try to exit the pattern at. Um, and like I said, that thing is so useful for different things, spare shooting um, and just a bunch, array of different things that we use it for. Um, like you said, the flex walker over there to the left, um, we, we load in patterns to that thing all the time. Anybody that wants to come in, uh, we can put out uh, special patterns for them if they're going to bowl a tournament somewhere. Uh, we have Specto uh, that is on all four lanes. Uh, right there we have uh, one of the patterns uh, overlaid over top of it. So we can kind of see, uh, looking at your equipment, if somebody comes in with a bag of you know six balls, let's say, we can look at their equipment and have them throw shots and find out uh, with the ball the way it is, is that ball skidding too far down the lane? Uh, is it going without, uh, you know, skidding without hooking in the right spot? We want that ball to to do a certain thing at the end of the pattern. Is it doing that? So we can look at that with the, the big 65 inch TV that has Specto on it uh, and kind of break that down. And then that way people have that information going forward. Um, and this is just kind of like an overview shot of it um, from when you first walk into it. Uh, we also have Steltronic scoring. Uh, the Steltronic scoring allows us to uh, spot any pins you want. So if you want to practice the 3610, uh, you can spot that over and over and over again. Um, and this is the shot of the pro shop that is also attached to it on the other side of the wall. So we have every manufacturer uh, on our walls and all of their current products. Uh, so it's a, it's a good place for people to come in, even if you're not going to our pro shop. Like the, the idea is that B3 Performance is a training facility. Uh, if you come into Bowl 300 Pro Shop, which is uh, inside of B3 Performance, uh, we can definitely take a look at your, your equipment, find out any gaps in it. Uh, or if you just want to come in and see what the newest ball is from one of the manufacturers, we have it. And you'll be able to see it, ask us questions about it. Uh, will that fit in your bag? Yes or no. Uh, and then kind of go from there as far as uh, any other pro shop uh, needs. Well, and, and also a, a small shrine there to world champion and U.S. amateur <laughs> champion Cortez Shank. Uh, so tell us, tell us how Cortez fits into the whole the whole deal, and um, I know he'll have some great insight for us today. But uh, I mean, it's, it's got to be a pretty a uh, pretty important guy to uh, to have the shrine uh, right there, especially over the water fountain. We know hydration is very important in athletics, so uh, I'm yes. sure the athletes spend a lot of time uh, looking at these medals and jerseys. So uh, just tell us about Cortez's role in the success of B3. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, family cove, as we call it. So uh, I I've known Cortez and his dad, Steve, for uh, since Tez was probably 11 or 12. Um, and Steve is one of my best friends, uh, his dad. And I've watched kind of Cortez obviously grow up. And, um, you know, we, we, we're pretty hard on Tez. Uh, so we're, uh, we're not the easiest of gentlemen on him. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, we're very. Uh, I'm. I'm so proud of Tez and what he's accomplished just as a as a young guy. Uh, and you know, the bowling aside, Tez is just. Uh, he's just our kid. Since we don't have any kids, he uh, he's kind of been my uh, beat up kid that uh, I've gotten since uh, I've I've met him. And uh, it's just. I'm excited for to see what he does in the sport. Uh, obviously, he's super gifted. Um, and he was gifted before I knew him as far as bowling. Uh, but just to see him come in here and he takes, he takes every dime he practices, he takes it for, you know, as serious as it is, uh, because in the future, he hopes that it's his job. I mean, he wants to, to be a professional bowler and, um, you know, he has the talent for it, but there's a lot of guys and a lot of girls that have a lot of talent and it's, it's a mindset when you get out there to bowl against the best and, I think he's starting to learn that as he's getting older. And uh, I think only the best is going to come for him. But that was a way for us just from all the stuff that he's helped us with. I mean, if when we used to travel, he would watch our dog, which is my prized possession. So uh, that was a big deal. So to make a little shrine for him uh, and kind of, you know, showcase that, you know, Team USA is a big deal. And we have a lot of youth bowlers that come in uh, in the facility and, and it's kind of something for them to shoot shoot for and look up to uh, because it's a lot of work and you don't just get to drill a bone ball and be Cortez Shank. You have to put in the work and, you know, hopefully they get to see some of that 
uh, and when they come in here, and he's in here a lot, and he does a lot of our lessons for us, and the youth really, I mean, because he's just so synonymous with winning on the West Coast, so uh, the youth really kind of look up for, up to him and Wesley when he's here too, so it's nice having two of the premier youth bowlers when they were youth in the building. I mean, it's there's a lot of titles between those two Yahoo, so it's good to good to have both of them around. Well, for those uh, just joining us here on Inside the OC, this is a milestone episode number 50, and we're ready to make the transition from celebrating our past successors and champions uh, to getting ready for the upcoming event. May 1st is opening day in Las Vegas. Uh, I am Matt Canizaro, and joining us right now is Mike Calderon of B3 Performance in Arizona, former PBA and PWBA Tour, tour rep. He knew us so much, very knowledgeable, uh, and uh, he also – is a competitor at the OC. Uh, again, uh, you're there to coach generally those who have found success, but uh, you've had your fair share as well. And, and you mentioned Cortez many times already. You guys got to team up in 2019 at the Open Championships for his debut. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the career of Mike Calderon at the USBC Open Championships. As you can see, uh, things got off to a slow start back in 2003, <laughs> but you kept coming back. You kept uh, giving it all you could. And, um, you know, we'll talk a, a lot over the rest of the show about how to find success at the OC. And 1,800, always kind of the, the goal number for most folks. But, uh, Mike, tell us about some of these numbers. And, and going back to your debut in 2003, uh, Cortez uh, was just a tyke back then. Uh, barely yeah. oh. barely able to, uh, to even know what's going on at that point. But uh, tell us about your debut walking into the Knoxville facility there an awesome venue we even had enough room for a side event uh extra lanes yeah. uh, for a side tournament but uh some rough scores but again you came back uh you took a year off it was uh it's definitely uh it might, might have stung a little bit but tell us about that debut uh not necessarily the scores but just walking in and, and the experience itself yeah i mean i was only uh i had just gotten back to bowling 2002 was when i first started back bowling uh after playing basketball uh, for a lot of years. Um, and I mean, I was, I, I figured myself as athletic, but not really knowing how to bowl again. Um, and uh, like I said, a couple guys from here, uh, were putting a team together. They needed somebody. I said, I'm going to be terrible, but I'll go. I mean, it's, it's an experience. Um, and so we went to not, uh, Knoxville and, uh, I remember just walking out and thinking, wow, this is gigantic. This isn't like a regular bowling center. Um, this is, my name is really big. Uh, it feels like everybody's watching me. Uh, so there's a little bit of a, you know, oh, my God moment. Uh, and I think that's what I try to tell people all the time is that I, I've been there. I've shot below 500. I know how it works. Uh, you know, and, and like you say, you just have to keep kind of grinding through it and getting the processes. But those years, those first couple of years, I mean, yeah, I took 2004 off. Um, I, I probably would say that the team didn't want me back. I, I could probably go out on a limb and say that. Um but uh, then I got to go back again on Baton Rouge uh, and the Baton Rouge, basically Baton Rouge and Corpus Christi. Um, those were with another team and uh, we had, it was more of a fun time. I would say that those guys weren't really too competitive, uh, but they had a great time and we enjoyed the, the area and, the, and some of the side tournaments and stuff like that. And then as we, you know, as you get up to about, 2007 that's when i started kind of doing the stuff with ebonite so 2007 2008 um and i got to talk to more people and try to soak up more information and more knowledge about you know how lanes play and and you know how, what to look for when you're at events like this and how to kind of set up bags so that you'll know what you're going through um and, and i bowled okay and then i think just the the in the middle there um, just no time to practice. Like I didn't, uh, I kind of knew what I wanted to do when I would show up at those events, but like, I just didn't have any time to practice. And, uh, in El Paso in 2015, I remember that tournament because we weren't even going to go. And then, uh, Brett was like, no, no, we gotta, we have to go. We have to go. You got, you, we have to go to El Paso. We drive there. And I remember we rented a truck like a uh, suburban and we got in the suburban, we drove, we had a 24 hour hotel, and okay. I'm like, I remember we got there. I'm like, this is a terrible idea. This was a stupid idea. I should have never done this idea. And so we bowled and, and I mean, I bowled terrible. Uh, and I was like, all right, if I'm going to go do this ever again, I'm like, we have to have a better plan of attack. So um, 
you know, then we went, I skipped another year uh, because I was just trying to figure out how to finish the rest of my stuff with uh, the tour and Ebonite. Um, and then uh, luckily the O'Keefe's uh, Shannon was putting a team together and needed a, a partner team. And uh, she said, uh, well, you get to bowl with your man crush, which is Brian O'Keefe. Uh, so if you want to bowl with Brian, then uh, we can put a team together if we can find one more person. And I said, uh, well, okay, if you'll have me, I said, I think I can find an all right person to come with us that uh, hasn't bowled before. Uh, so luckily I just told Tez that he was bowling nationals with me and they had no <laughs> choice. Uh, and so I said, well, how about Cortez? And they were like, yeah, if you can get Cortez, we'll take you. That's the baggage <laughs> and we'll bring on Cortez. And that makes good. So yeah, I mean, Matt Farber, uh, Brian O'Keefe, myself, Mr. Barnes, my boy, Kyle, and then Cortez. And it was, it was great. It was literally a last minute put together team, but I mean, between Cortez and Farber, I mean, their Team USA experience and just how they go about thinking on the lanes. Uh, you know, Matt is always thinking, all, every pin counts. Um, Kyle, when he's not, uh, you know, handling all of that Josie needs, because, like, that's the real Barnes. I mean, let's be honest, Josie is the real <laughs> Barnes. Kyle's my boy, but Josie is the real Barnes. So uh, when, you know, Kyle, he he loves bowling and Kyle throws it unbelievable. He just never bowls. Like he's just, ah, well, let's go golfing. And, you know, okay, I guess I'll bowl. So when they said he was bowling, I'm like, oh, that's a no brainer. And then, you know, Brian O'Keefe deep, uh, just, I mean, consummate. Uh, I, Brett has said that he thought Brian was the greatest collegiate bowler of all time. And, and mm -hmm. I've heard that from multiple people. Brian would say never, not a chance in hell that he is. But uh, Brian is his knowledge of the game and and how he goes about attacking lanes is is unbelievable. So I learn something every time I talk with Brian and get to hang out with him. And I said, well, I'll I'll make sure that I can have a drink for everybody. And you know, we just kind of went about our business. And it was funny because that uh, we bowled during uh, bowl expo time, so there was a lot of the superstars in the building. Uh, and they were all sitting back because that's a chance for them to light me up. If I can't bowl, then they're like, why would you help us on tour if you can't throw a bowling ball? So uh, that was fun that we got to bowl with all them watching. And then we looked up and we said, hey, well, we have an actual chance of maybe mm -hmm. getting close to the lead here if we actually finish this last game out. So uh, we bowled pretty good. I mean, I, I think for a group of guys that never really – bowls that much other than maybe Farber, but he hasn't bowled very much lately. Uh, last time I talked to him, but Cortez bowls the most out of all of us. And um, I think for the most part, we did pretty good for a group of guys that we just paced together. So hopefully uh, we're going to put that team back together or put the, bring the band back and try it one more time in Vegas and going forward and see if we can get a top of the list one time. Well, it was a lot of fun to be there for that week, for that day. You guys made a run at the team title, as you said, finished in eighth place, uh, which that's pretty awesome at the Open Championships. But uh, during that story, you hit on a lot of good points about the event. First, the grandeur of the venue, right? It's so intimidating compared to what you might be used to at home. That's number one. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to prepare for what that experience is like. You can hear about it, but until you walk out onto the lanes and really uh, see the high ceilings and just it just feel so different. So that's one important factor. Uh, you mentioned the preparation that it takes. It is not your Thursday night league at home. There, there is preparation that needs to happen in order for you to be ready. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about some of those misconceptions and, and the things that uh, the bowlers maybe miss uh, as they're getting ready. And then, you know, you mentioned the importance of understanding your equipment and the arsenal and, and setting it up uh, to be able to travel and succeed at this event but uh while we do that let's bring in cortez the expert uh and just get some insight from him of course uh cortez welcome to inside the oc uh you have one open championships under your belt you bowled in 2019 on that team we saw that uh, and these guys i'm sure uh along with the harassment uh, even though knowing that you were going to carry the team most likely between you and farber uh the harassment that you might have received um it was up to them to help prepare you for this event and explain to you as much as they could. Of course, you've been in some of the biggest events that the world has to offer. You're a world champion. You've done a lot already, but there really is nothing like the Open Championship. So uh, from your perspective, 
going into this event for the first time, uh, you know, tell us what your thoughts were uh, compared to, to how Mike described 2003 uh, and what they did to help get you ready to be comfortable uh, at such a prestigious tournament. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, but yeah, that uh, event was really nerve wracking. You know, I've been a lot of different <laughs> scenarios, some some high pressure situations, um, but definitely w walking on the stage and stuff like that is definitely different. Um, being on that team um, was different as well. You know, I was like, oh, among some pretty good bowlers and some very smart individuals in the bowling industry. Um, so there's a lot of pressure that I was feeling. And then to make it worse, I was like, all right, I'm just praying that I'm not going to be the anchor. Put me in the two hole. <laughs> and we'll go from there. We look up, I'm the anchor. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> so that didn't make it any easier. Um, so like the one thing I would say for anyone going into it, whether it's your first time, your second, or, you know, if you keep going into it, whatever. Um, I think, you know, getting ready and <clears throat> having like, you know, a game plan going into it and just knowing that, you know, this is not going to be your normal league and being prepared for that is key. Uh, I don't think I prepared for it uh, well enough mentally. I think the nerves got to, they got the best of me. I know Mike was hyping me up saying like, I bowl all the time and stuff and I do, but I unfortunately kind of uh, was the boat anchor that year <laughs> for, the, for, the team, for the team event. But um, no, I had a great time. I learned a lot um, going into it. You know, uh, Mike and I, we went through my arsenal and stuff like that. Obviously that's really key, making sure you have a really diverse and versatile arsenal you don't want to bring six balls that are all that all do the same thing you want a ball gets down the lane when the lanes break down you want some that's earlier it's smoother um so you know mike helped me a lot with that spare shooting is another big thing um spare is like the easiest way to improve your score i know spares are always like the most boring thing to practice <laughs> when you're at home it's like that but that'll you know bring in the most money at the end of the day <laughs> if you can make your spares so um those are definitely some of the biggest things mike and i worked on as well as you know how we want to attack the pattern, you know, using your, you know, your 10 minutes, 15 minutes of practice to warm up and uh, break the lanes down is another key thing that uh, we worked on as well. Well, now for those who aren't as familiar, the open championships now since 2013 features two challenging lane conditions, right? It's more on the sport bowling side of things. So, so uh, the oil a little bit flatter across the lane, much different than you'd be used to on your typical house shot, uh, which again, one of the misconceptions and folks come out to the event, uh, they maybe don't realize that or they don't understand it until they experience it for the first time that uh, the lane conditions are not as forgiving as you would see at home. So if you miss to the outside, the ball's probably not going to hook back. If you miss to the inside, it will give the perception uh, that there's no oil in the middle of the lane, right? So it's just, it's different. And it's something that uh, it does take work. Um, and it's just because it's the national championship event you want to earn those scores and those eagles, right? You don't want it to be a, a, a shootout per se or a carry contest. So uh, for you guys, as the experts, if somebody walks in to the training center, uh, knowing that they're headed to the open championships, how do you help them understand the, the difficulty of the oil patterns? Again, they're not super, super hard, but they're just different, right? So it's something that, uh, you know, it takes a, a different mindset, maybe some different preparation to the equipment, um, but they're scorable. The patterns are set up each year to allow different angles and, and different styles to be able to get the ball to the pocket. So that's not the, the situation. It's just that uh, it's a new environment. Uh, Cortez, you mentioned spares being so important. At home, we maybe don't shoot a whole lot of spares, right? We're uh, you know higher scoring environment. Uh, strikes are fun. Everybody likes strikes. But uh, out here uh, in this environment, uh, shot making, accuracy, uh, and spare shooting, all very important. So I think the first thing, uh, most important, because the the bowlers will come in and they'll say the the, the conditions are impossible. I don't even know <laughs> how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go out and I'm going to average 30 pins less than I do at home, but which is probably true. You're going to average less than you do at home, but so is everybody else, right? You're not bowling against yourself in league. You're bowling against everybody else on the same condition, uh, knowing that it takes some strategy and preparation and understanding. So uh, first things first, uh, when people come in fearful of the environment they're going to experience, how do you calm them down and get them as prepared for that as possible? And, and Mike, if you want to go first and then Cortez, uh, you know, your insight, uh, you know, especially dealing with some of the younger players as well. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, most, most of the time when people come in, uh, I ask them, first and foremost, is that 
the people that you're bowling with, are they willing to all bowl together? Are you guys willing to bowl together? Because you can have the greatest plan in the world, but if you go out there and you, you're one of nine people on the lane and you're trying to do what the plan is and somebody else is not doing it, then you're already, your sink is you're already sunk. Like your ship is already going down. So most of the time I always start with, okay, do you have, uh, and this was even before we had the facility, but uh, do you have five people that are willing to play in the same part of the lane, even if that's not a comfort zone for you? Because like you had said, Matt, there's different angles and different ways to attack that pattern. Um, and we watched uh, PJ's team the night before us, PJ Haggerty and those guys bowled and they bowled really good too. And they were attacking the lanes way straighter uh, and using way different equipment than what we ended up using. Um, but we both got the balls to the same spot down lane. So, um, but you know, if you have uh, one guy that's gonna play five and one guy that's gonna play 15, well, you guys are going to make the, that pattern really unplayable. So first, I, that, that's the first thing I say. And if they say, yeah, we're willing to play together, then I say, okay, we, you need to start looking at your equipment and realize that what your equipment is for your typical Thursday night league shot is not going to work up there because it's designed for your typical Thursday night league shot. Like that, that you have equipment based off that. We, we wouldn't, most pro shop operators are not going to drill a bowling ball for nationals and then say, well, here you just spent whatever amount of money don't use that ball in league, only use it for nationals. Well, that's, it's a new toy. Of course you're going to want to use it. Like you just bought it. So, you know, a lot of times the bags that people have are designed for their bowling center, which is what you're supposed to do. Design something for somebody that they're going to use day in and day out. And so I will tell people we might want, if you don't want to buy a new piece and that makes perfect sense because money is expensive. Uh, if you don't want to buy a new piece, maybe we can take some of your other stuff and change the surfaces on those bowling balls to make them do something different that wouldn't work on Thursday night league, but will probably be a little bit beneficial up there at a pattern that is going to be much flatter uh, and give you a little bit more, you know, forgiveness. And it's amazing on some of the mindsets that people have when they come in, Oh, I need to make this ball super, super shiny. So they get down the lane because everything hooks so much there. And I'm like, but you're not really doing that. You're just delaying the amount of hook that's going to happen when it gets to the end of the pattern. It's going to be even sharper. So let's let's try to get something that slows down a little bit more in the middle of the lane where you want to play and stop playing the end of the pattern, play more towards the middle of the pattern. So most of the time, and now beauty of this place in here is that we can put out nationals and I can say, you know, okay, on Saturday, we're going to do a nationals team pattern and watch you come in here with your equipment so that they can visually see it because sometimes it's hard to see. if you don't see it it's hard to know what to do when you get there and cortez can you know spawn on that part let me interrupt real quick there it's a, another good point uh and another misconception as well uh we don't publish what the oil patterns are for the open championships until the event is over so you get that in in your head that uh, well, I, you don't know what the pattern is. How do you prepare, right? But the patterns are are pretty similar in, in how challenging they are from year to year. Uh, so that's something that you mentioned, having the past patterns out there, uh, but without knowing the exact situation. How do you utilize the, those past ideas and experiences to, uh, to help them? Obviously, uh, bowling on a, a tougher pattern uh, is going to help improve the things, the accuracy, the shot making, uh, even though it's not the pattern, how do you explain that to, to the average bowlers who come in and, and they're already taking the first step by being there? They want to prepare and learn and get ready. Uh, but how do you clearly explain how that will help them, even though it's not the exact pattern they'll see? Um, well, first, I you know, usually what I say is that you want to try to get a range of what it is. Like exactly like you said, if you look, go back and look at most of the uh, nationals patterns, uh, the, the length and distance and volume and all those numbers are fairly close. Like they're pretty close to that same area. So what I always say is that you're probably not going to go nationals with one ball. So if you're going to go with multiple bowling balls, let's get a ball that's on this side of the pattern, uh, of the long side of it and the short side of it, and get one right in the middle so that you have a balance to go back and forth. You're, you're, it, it doesn't really, I try to explain to him, it doesn't really matter if I had this year's pattern and I put it on our lanes. It's a different environment topography of the lane is different it'd be no different than if you go to your golf course on tuesday and you putt on the green and then they move the hole to another location on the golf and you you hit the ball to the exact same spot 
it's going to roll a little differently because of the undulation of the the greens. Same with same with nationals and the patterns. Our, we have the same lane beds. We have the same Brunswick Pro Avalanche lane surfaces, but we don't have the same topography. The building is upstairs. It's got different environment. It's a much bigger place. So I try to get them more knowledge on knowing your surroundings and not so much on thinking there's a magic ball that's going to work for USBC Nationals team pattern. Like there isn't a magic ball, but if you have some options on the good side and the down, you know, the, the plus and the minus side of your bag, then you could throw the ball that you think is right. And you go, ah, that's a little too long, but I do have a ball that's a little less than that. So now you go to the ball, it's a little less than that. And then you just have to get back to where you're making good shots. Because like you said earlier, it, it comes down to shot making at the end of the day. And so that's kind of from a pro shop aspect, kind of how I start looking at their bag. Now from a, a, a lesson standpoint and preparation from somebody asking somebody Cortez can probably expound on that a little bit more as far as what you people ask questions on how do I play the lanes or what should I look for yeah I think um I think one of the biggest issues that arises for you know bowlers going out there or just any tournament in general is that you know they may be like you know this x tournament that's coming up is on cheetah for example and they're like well luckily my home bowling center is putting out cheetah and I'm playing here and I'm throwing it here and it's looking great. I'm using this ball and they go to the tournament at a different bowling center and they play there and they bowl terrible and they just blame it on the bowling center, all this stuff. I think a lot of people fail to realize, like what Mike said, the topography is different. There's a lot of different external factors that are gonna, you know, make the lanes play a lot different. You know, it's really nice B3. We have the capabilities to lay out, you know, past patterns and stuff like that, but you have to use it more as like a general idea of how to play patterns and understanding your arsenal and the different shapes that they're gonna that each ball is gonna give you. Um, instead of just saying that this ball looks good on this day, it's, it has to work when I get up there. If it doesn't work, I'm done. I'm going down to the casino. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think that's one of the I think that's one of the biggest things people have to understand is you know when you're practicing on patterns and and stuff like that, you're just really trying to pay attention to, you know, how much misroom do you have in general? Like obviously it's not your typical house shot. Like you, you're gonna understand or realize really quickly that it's a lot harder and you have to be a lot more accurate. It's also, you know, very eye-opening that this ball does this um, more than this ball, you know. So we're in league, you know, maybe like two of the bowling balls that are drilled simi simi similarly, um, but are, you know, one's shiny, one's dull. They still might roll kind of similar because how soft the pattern is. Um, I just think practicing on patterns, some of that just really um, opens your eyes up to how, you know, difficult it is and the gaps in your arsenal. Um, but people just need to, again, realize that when you go up there, it's, it's not going to be the same and you can't just expect to stay in the same spot and do the same thing that you're doing in practice and expect an amazing result. So if nothing else, first steps, uh, if you want to get ready for an event like the open championships, if you seek out those more challenging lane conditions, whether it be at a training center or at your home center, often the proprietor would be more than happy to uh, set aside time in a week or, or in a day to be able to lay out different patterns, uh, not specific, uh, again, to that event, but just something more challenging, something that will challenge you to become more accurate and, and that automatically is going to help with your understanding and, and with your game. And so step one is, is to seek that out. And then two, as you said, to understand your arsenal. How do the balls react compared to each other and then compared maybe to some other conditions that you're used to? Uh, and for Cortez, you know, especially with the Team USA events, uh, when you leave home, you don't know what the patterns are going to be that you're going to face. You have a general idea, uh, and you also have a six-ball limit in that case. So uh, at the OC, you can bring eight bowling balls. Sometimes uh, that's going to be a little too much, too much overthinking. But uh, with a six-ball arsenal and, and you're just not sure, uh, you know you have to set that up in a way. And for our OC bowlers, that might be two balls. It might be four balls. It might be six or eight balls. But to set it up in a way that they're different enough and versatile enough but at the same time, knowing that it's going to be two different oil patterns, you have the ability to also change the surface, right? After team events over, you can reevaluate. Uh, you can watch a little doubles and singles or practice uh, at the bowler's journal uh, and then adjust your equipment. So those four balls or, or two balls then now become exponentially more simply by adjusting the surface, whether it's on your own with expertise from you guys or – uh, at one of the pro shops on site, right? All of those folks are there to help and help you succeed. 
uh, because uh, if you're walking out of there happy, uh, they've done well, and 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 you'll come back and 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 patronize them again. And so, um, you know, talk about that part of it, Cortez, and just just getting the equipment ready, uh, and really how you can turn two or four balls uh, into so many more options. Yeah, I mean, it's like you said, it's difficult when you go like the Team USA events and you have no clue what the pattern is. I mean, you have a general idea sometimes, but. Um, it's, it's definitely tricky. I struggle every year for every event I've been to. I'm always like, we, me and Mike go through it all the time. We're like, we write all, write all my balls out. We're like, all right, these ones are guaranteed. These are all maybes. And then I go practice with them. I practice with all of them. I figure out which ones I like the most, which ones I think give me the most, you know, versatile shapes and we go from there. And then as well as I bring a bunch of Avalon pads into the change surfaces because, you know, there's some bowling balls that react better to, you know, surface changes. I know I can manipulate the ball a little better. Some balls I have that I really like. Um, and they can only really sit at one surface. I change the surface on them and I hate them. They're terrible. <laughs> um, so I have to understand that as well. You know, I want to, you know, give, give myself as many options as possible when I go to these tournaments, um, as well as layouts. Um, Mike is a layout king, but, um, you know, it's important to have a couple, um, trick layouts with you sometimes, you know, most of my stuff is pretty standard, but I usually always try to bring that one ball that, you know, gives me a, a, a crazy shape that no one else in the building is probably going to have just in case the lanes get a certain way that, I've seen happen before. So now all of this can be very intimidating. If, if you're going to be a first timer, you've been a couple times and you're just trying to get comfortable in the environment and figure it out. Uh, there's a lot happening and it happens very quickly. Once <laughs> yes. you get to the host city, uh, luckily you, you know, you're hopefully surrounded by teammates and friends who are there to, to help and, and work together, right? It's all about the chemistry and the communication. And uh, then once you get on site, you know, we have the ability to, help prepare even more. We have team practice sessions that put out the actual pattern for this year. Uh, and that will be uh, potentially at an offsite bowling center typically. Uh, so it's going to be, again, a little bit different, but you get an idea. You also get an opportunity to, to just sharpen the skills a little bit uh, and get a feel for your equipment, get your legs under you now that you've traveled from wherever uh, to Las Vegas. Uh, and then the Bowlers Journal Championships, a side event, extra prize money up for grabs, but that gives you an opportunity to see the doubles and singles oil patterns. So uh, a, a lot of choices and, and options once you're on site uh, to be able to put the finishing touches. But uh, right now we're eight weeks away from the start of the event. Those are great ways to finalize everything. But there's a lot that can happen in the weeks in between, right? Between now and when you come to the Open Championship. It's not just a one-day stop at B3 Performance and, hey, I'm going to get ready for the Open Championships. But – Right. Uh, if you if you commit yourself and 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 really if a goal, or if you have actual goals at the event, whether you want to improve your all event score by a hundred pins, or you want to cash this year, or you want to shoot eighteen hundred, like these are all attainable goals, uh, and they're realistic, but they're going to take a little bit of work, and it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. So I imagine uh, folks will come in and you can help set them with a process again, whether it be with you at another training center or on their own just a general playbook for preparing for this event. Again, more than a one time, one day deal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's exactly like you said, it's, it, it's not something uh, open championships, local tournament clubs, uh, whatever you're, you're gaining information and knowledge for uh, you definitely can't just go in and get one ball and practice one time and go to your bowling center that you locally go if they put out the nationals pattern from last year and bowl on it one time like you're spending a lot of money to go to the open championships just in travel and hotels and the tournament and everything else and equipment maybe if you're buying new equipment so give yourself a fighting chance and you know make sure that you try a few different things maybe polish all your bowling balls and bowl on it on the saturday morning team and try to see what it looks like. See, get some information on those balls. And then maybe halfway through, sand them all and try it and see if it rolls better. And then next week, do the vice versa so that you can see, okay, my bowling balls reacted this way this time, and next time they reacted this way. So the more information that you can take notes and write down, the better you're going to be when you get there. Because exactly like you said, Matt, when you get there, everything is faster. It's in every level you go, the, the higher the stakes, the faster it goes. The guys on TV with, that make TV shows will tell you the exact same thing. You're on those five frames that you throw, you don't even remember them. And next thing you know, you have 87 in the fifth, and you're like, oh my God. 
and it's halfway over now. Like, I don't know what to do. So the more times that you can prepare for information before that, the better you're going to be. So taking notes, making sure that you have all of your accessories, you have enough shoe slides because the approaches are different. You have Avalon pads because you want to change the surface. Uh, you know, the, the guys and girls that run those booths up at Nationals, they do a great job. They're there every day. Nobody gives Bobby Brust and those guys enough credit uh, that they're there, you know, 12, 14 hours a day and people walk in and I've been there. What ball is going to make me strike at the Nationals this year? And if you're coming at that point and you're already in the booth and you bowl in an hour and you're asking Bobby Brust what ball is going to work for the Nationals, you're not prepared. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things where you're going to want to make sure that, you know, even if it feels like it's overkill for you, it's not overkill when you get to nationals, it's not overkill at those, at the masters, you know, though you're, like you said, there's going to be people surrounding you that hopefully have been there before. And it's not a whole 10 people's first trip to nationals, but anything that they will tell you, you should just absorb and try to live in the moment of it because before you know it, team events over and now you have singles and doubles. And, and if you bowl bad in team event, that doesn't necessarily mean your trip is ruined. It, it, maybe you just chalk that up to, okay, I saw what the lanes did. I wasn't prepared for that. But I still have six more games now that I can come back and bowl well. And Cortez will tell you that, that he felt like he didn't bowl good during the team squad. And, you know, he was a little nervous. And it's a big deal. Listen, when they announce your name as a national amateur champion and next to you is Shannon O'Keefe and on the other side of the lanes is – Danielle McEwen, there was a lot of people in that building at that time. So that was a pretty rough first event. But when you're a newbie, even if you're not as seasoned as somebody like a Cortez or, or Shannon O'Keefe, when you go there, you might be bowling next to Shannon O'Keefe. And that's something that you have to prepare for. And guess what? Shannon O'Keefe is a normal bowler just like you are. She paid her entry just like you did. So use your time and make that preparation for what your event is. And, and stay in your moment. Don't try to engulf everything. You know, keep, keep it simple. That's, what, that's the best I can say when you're there. Because like you said, Matt, you've been there. I mean, you, you've, you've bowled in the Open Championships. Obviously, you, you run most of it for half the time, so you're in the building enough. But even, I would as, as suppose, even you, the first time you walk in, when they set it all up for each year, you walk in, you go, oh, it's pretty grand again. It's the Open Championships. It's a big deal. Well, I, I get the goosebumps every day. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, in a year, for example, we're in the National Bowling Stadium in Reno. You know, you walk up the escalator, uh, goosebumps. You walk down the center aisle, you just look. Even when it's empty and it's mm -hmm. midnight and no, nobody's, nobody's around, you have the place yourself, goosebumps. Because you understand the magnitude of the venue and the event. Uh, and then it's being able to put aside those nerves and those feelings to be able to succeed. And uh, Cortez, let's face it, Mike didn't really set the bar super high as far as first times go uh, at the OC, but uh, there's so much more to it than, you know, just the bowling part. There's the camaraderie and the vacation and, and just all of the things that surround the bowling. But uh, for you coming out, looking at those numbers and, and knowing what you know about the event, um, you know, you're going to want to set goals for yourself and, and your goals might be loftier than mine, of course, based on your experience. But uh, did you come out with, uh, with, with a set of goals, things you wanted to accomplish in your first year, uh, I, I know, you, you know, there's a 50% chance here you're going to say that you, were, you wanted to win an Eagle in your first year, which totally makes sense. Uh, but I, I think there's there's probably smaller goals along the way of things that, that you would have been happy to accomplish at the OC to, to feel that you had a successful year, even if there wasn't a trophy presentation at the end. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, my first year, uh, my first goal was to keep on the lane. Not the first shot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But uh, no, I mean... Uh, you know, it was a little uh, disappointing, like when Mike's after team block. Um, you know, I knew we had a chance to. We actually, yeah, we had we had a run to make the to get an eagle, and I was the low man on the team. <laughs> so obviously, that was a little uh, demoralizing. But um, you know, for my first my first like main goal is like if I shoot above eighteen hundred, you know, average above two hundred, I'll take it for my first year. Um, I knew I was be really nervous um, going into it. I was nervous going like just driving up there and stuff. So. Um, you know, I would say I was I was happy overall that I shot above 1800. I was, I was cool with that. Um, but going forward, um, I would love to win the Eagle. Um, that's definitely a huge goal of mine. Um, the best, the best of all, win the Eagles. And I think that's a, a lot of everyone who goes to bowl that. You know, that's kind of the main goal. I mean, make money, 
yes, but also win the Eagle. I think the prestige is more valuable than the uh, monetary value of money for that event. Um, so, but yeah, the first trip, it was a lot of fun. Uh, hang out with Mike, Brian, O'Keefe, Kyle Barnes and Farber. Um, it was more than just bowling. It was just, you know, a good time to have some, some people I haven't seen in a while and meet some new people and just be around some really intelligent individuals. So that was just, it was a great trip overall. Yeah. Okay. Now, Mike, with, with your extensive career at the OC again, uh, eventually you'll, you'll hopefully forget about some of the scores, the prize money gets spent, uh, but it's about so much more, right? It's, it's a whole experience. So uh, just looking back at the last almost 20 years for you, uh, do you have any standout moments that aren't necessarily score related that, that really make you remember and, and appreciative uh, of the open championships and, and all it's about from teammates to host cities to hopefully, uh, you know, some stories that you can tell on bowl TV. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, probably the, the, my most memorable, uh, OC experience would probably be Reno. The first time I got to bowl at the bowling stadium. Um, just because like you said, walking out of the center aisle, uh, you know, being in the squad room in the back and then walking past the pin setters, which you can eat off of because those guys keep those pins, so uh, those machines so clean. Uh, and then walking down the center aisle and, you know, having people in the stands and you walk out and it's so massive. Um, that's probably the busy, you know, the biggest to this point, uh, of my experiences just because it's just such a, a grand, uh, experience in the bowling world. Like, I mean, I've been part of some of the biggest stages that they they've created for bowling, you know, being Dallas Cowboy stadium is a pretty big place to put bowling lanes. So, uh, when, you know, you look up and you see, everything that is in that place. And you're like, oh, this is pretty big. But when you get to bowl uh, or open championships with 10,000, 15,000 teams that are going to be there over the course of a year, um, that means something. Like, that's a that's a big deal. Um, so I think that's probably the most memorable up until, uh, you know, last year was obviously a great time and a good run. But I, I would probably say that last year was just – it was just funner being out with everybody. Like, you know, it, it's – most of the people on that team uh, is in a business atmosphere. Most of the time I'm with them. Like Brian O'Keefe it's it's we're working when we're together and Farber is bowling and competing and Cortez is competing. Um, and, you know, I, I don't ever get to see Barnes, but uh, when I do see Barnes, he's usually getting ready to go back out on the golf course. So like, I, it's, I don't, I don't get to hang out for, you know, a couple days with those guys. So that's probably uh, being able to, turn off the business mode of bowling for me because it's, it's, you know, in 2003, it was fun. It was bowling as just a newbie coming in going, Oh my God, I'm going to bowl nationals. Uh, and then over the years, as I got more and more involved in the sport and with manufacturers, it became more of a job and showing up there, it was a lot of work to then just get an hour and a half, two hours of bowling with my buddies. So I think now I've kind of figured out a way to kind of manage both of it. And I, enjoyed last year it was a blast and so looking forward moving forward uh, i just look forward to more times uh with friends on the lanes and i think that you know like cortez said he, he might have been a little disappointed let's say at his team but it didn't it, you know his team sh uh, scores but he didn't he he's bold enough events uh that the next day i mean i was like all right well i don't really care about team because now you're my doubles partner so i need you to at least try to strike today uh, if it wasn't yesterday. Um, but I think that that's a huge thing that a lot of people uh, should really look uh, at when they go is you're not bowling. Every shot isn't on team. You have a full weekend or two days worth of bowling and that singles and doubles, you know, you, who knows? Your team might win a team all events eagle if you guys bowl good the next two events. So uh, I think because of the team event, you walk out and it's such a, you know, like, grand thing i think people get so wrapped up in that that they forget that there's other things that the open championship bowlers journal uh btms there's there's all these side action side events that you can learn a lot meet a lot of people and who knows maybe you bowl the bowlers journal and you bowl next to some guy from new york and you guys strike up a conversation now you're you're lifelong friends and you might even bowl with their team next year so there's so much else at the open championships uh that i've experienced in all those side events and stuff like that and people that i've met that 
you know, the nine games on the lanes is fun and it's a little nerve wracking uh, at first. Uh, but the amount of stuff that you do around the Open Championships is, I think, with all the memories that I have of that. And, you know, like you said, most of them I can't really share on, on Bull TV. But uh, I did I, – hanging out with everybody is all is the, the creme de la creme of it. Well, as we wind down and, and uh, just get ready to, to, to wrap things up, and let's su- summarize a little bit about, you know, what we've been talking about, Cortez. Now, we're going to have bowlers coming from all 50 states uh, – and at times, maybe not in 2021, but several foreign countries as well, all different environments, whether it be a six-lane center uh, in small-town Idaho or the biggest bowling center in Detroit, where you know such a, a huge number of our members come from. Just totally different experiences, uh, but coming in to the Open Championships. So uh, just to summarize a little bit, Cortez, maybe the, the top three pieces of advice you have for folks uh, in handling the event, and, and the environment, especially, uh, you know, depending where you come from and, uh, and what they need to do to be as prepared as possible. The, just the small things they can work on coming in just to be as ready uh, as they can. Definitely. Yeah. So I think first and foremost is spares. Again, spares are key. That'll increase your scores quicker than anything else. The strikes will come. Um, spares are the key. Uh, second, I would say, you know, understanding your arsenal making going through um, your balls with your pro shop operator, um, practicing, practicing with them on, you know, different patterns, some of that, understanding how they're different, different from each other and when they're good and when they aren't good um, is super key to uh, bowling well at the open championships. And last but not least is I think, you know, not getting overwhelmed. Um, I know that I got affected from that a little bit walking across the approach again, seeing my name up there among some other really great bowlers and bright individuals. And I think, you know, just, you know, maybe just putting yourself in that situation, just like thinking about it, ima- like, you know, imagining it um, will help alleviate some of the nerves. Um, but yeah, just try not to get overwhelmed and enjoy the moment, stay in the moment. Don't uh, think about, you need to strike every shot. Just enjoy, enjoy it for what it is and just have a great time. Uh, Cortez, you had a, a very unique first time at the OC, of course. Uh, you ended your first day of competition by getting your picture taken with your team. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think uh, perhaps just the, the small taste of success there uh, changes your, your view of the event. Uh, I know you, you understand the history of the tournament and the sport, uh, but to get that close so young, uh, that has to have you very excited to come back in 2021, especially now after missing 2020. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm ex- super excited to get back in the lanes. I'm, I'm really hoping our, I, I don't think we've confirmed if we are bowling yet, um, but I'm praying that we are because <laughs> we got so close and I'm ready this year. I'm not going to let the nerves get to me and I'm going to give my all. And I definitely want that Eagle. And I know we were so close last year and I know I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I didn't give my best performance in team. So, you know, I really think we have a great chance this year and I'm, I'm looking for a great time and definitely going for the Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, Mike, from, from your perspective, uh, you've seen it kind of from both sides. So if you can put on multiple hats for me here, uh, you know, from a traditional pro shop operator, uh, when you did not have the training center, you had bowlers come in, of course, at all times and, and want to get ready for the open championships. Uh, and so if you could give uh, just just some basic tips for them, how can they leave your pro shop? And go and prepare for the Open Championships just in their bowling center at home, uh, you know, without any of the, the expert advice that you now can offer at, at B3. Correct. Um, I think the the most thing that I was always telling people is, you know, get uh, I'm a big proponent of writing down all of your equipment, making sure whether you do it in a notebook or whether you do it on an Excel form and writing it down, writing out what the surfaces are. Uh, and knowing your your bag, literally, I mean, I keep all the stats here. So, I mean, I can always email everybody their stats but uh, or their specs on it, excuse me. But uh, knowing that first and foremost is what I would tell people um, at the pro shop before. Um, and then, uh, like you said earlier, go to your bowling center. Uh, most of our bowling centers around the valley, we have one or two that will put out a pattern, whatever that pattern is, whether it be an old open championships pattern or just something that's even if they put out something that's flatter, it doesn't really matter. Just something that's not a house shot. That's not going to be eight to one uh, so that you can see what your ball is actually truly doing, because you will notice that there's probably differences. And if there isn't differences, then we need to make differences. And that's something that the bowler can do uh, without having to go back to the pro shop with a simple 
Avalon pad um, that you can get at any of your pro shops. And then just that's something that you can visually see. I think with the advent of everybody's smartphones and how good the videos that they take and some of the apps that they have on those videos or on the phones, you can set up your, your camera. And I tell people, set up your camera or your phone by the lane so you can watch what the ball does. And then as you get home, you can sit at your, in the comfort of your own home, look at the numbers that you have and look at what uh, those balls are doing on whatever pattern they tell you it is. And then say, okay, well, I can visually see now because before I was in the moment, I was bowling. Now I'm sitting down, I'm not bowling, I'm actually just watching what my ball does. And I can see that that ball goes a little longer than this ball or this ball uh, and this ball are the same. Then make your changes and go do it again. But I think, you know, similar to what Cortez said, uh, repetition is going to be the, the steady fast here. And changing stuff, if you sand your bowling balls, you can bring it back the other way. Like it's not when you sand it, it's not left that way or, or if you polish it, it's not left that way. Um, so making adjustments and, you know, those the manufacturers makes bowling balls based off of their arsenal and their line that's available for customers at the time. So every manufacturer will have in their own line, their balls done with a surface they believe fits in their gaps in their product. But if you don't have all of those balls and you don't buy them all at the same time, then you can alter those gaps to make them fit for you from one company to another company. So, you know, don't be afraid of changing ball surfaces. I'm a huge proponent of changing ball surfaces because it's an unfinished product. When we get it as a pro shop operator, we finish it by putting in holes for you. And then you can alter that by changing it with, you know, a little sanding here, a little polishing here. So I think the number one thing I would say uh, without having a training facility, if there's not one near you, like you said, uh, at all the ones across the country, if there isn't one near you, but there is a local bowling center near you, it, it's very, very much needed to write down your arsenal. And then maybe if you have a, a camcorder or your phone, set up a video of it and then start studying what your balls are doing after the fact, because not a lot of people can throw a bowling ball and see what their ball is doing. Like that's that's hard to do, no matter at what level you're at. So it's always good to have a pair of eyes. And if you if you don't trust anybody's eyes in your neck of the woods, trust your phone and then go back and look at your eyes. So that would be what I would say from that. And if you do have the ability to get down to a training facility and, you know, it, Vegas is a four hour drive from my doorstep to South Point's Plaza. I've done it a few times. Uh, if you can swing in here, we will have uh, at the start of nationals, we're going to do uh, a little during the weekends, we're going to do some type of uh, kind of camps here to kind of, you know, help people. We have the ability to social distance. Cortez is, is in the classroom right now on the other side of the building. Uh, I'm in the, the lanes, obviously. Uh, so we can put, you know, six people in the classroom, six people on the lane and then flip flop them uh, and give some more knowledge that way. So, uh, you know, you'll be able to check us out on Instagram, social media and all that stuff. Um, but uh, if you do have a training center near you, uh, reach out to them and find out if they're going to put something out, even if it's not the Nationals pattern, something that you can then go in there and do that same type of thing where you can alter the surfaces of your bowling balls and try different things uh, to see what works and what doesn't work. Well, you definitely beat me to it. I was going to ask you to speak from behind the new logo. Uh, as, an, as an individual, if I'm trying to get ready for the Open Championships, you mentioned – uh, the camps and different opportunities there, uh, and then potentially bringing in my whole team, right, to come in and talk mm -hmm. team strategy, uh, how to work together, how to communicate, how to understand each other's games, uh, to be able to to find success and make those quick decisions. And I can know what to do based on what your ball did. So uh, talk about some of those opportunities, some of the things available at B3 Performance, uh, cost-wise even, uh, whether it's a half day, a full day, uh, or any other packages that, that you might have or, or might develop uh, in order specifically to help bowlers get ready for the Open Championships beyond uh, just those uh, coming on the weekend type situations? Yeah, we're uh, we're still working on some things uh, for the packages and, and for pricing and stuff like that. But we definitely want, um, I mean, teams to come. We do have a few local teams uh, that have reached out to us um, that, again, like you said, the brains of the company is out actually running the company now while we're open. So uh, she's the she's the keeper of all monies. But uh we, we definitely uh, will be updating uh, 
our website and some information on social media platforms as far as how to get teams in here um, and to be able to keep everybody social distance. I mean, we use all of the Kegel cleaning products that they have. So we, we disinfect this place every hour on the hour uh, to keep everybody safe as possible uh, because we want everybody safe. Uh, but yeah, coming in as a team and, and getting to break down last year's or 2019's team pattern, uh, we, we think that most teams will have stuck together and it'd be a good insight to come in and say, okay, what did you guys do? Let's do that on lane one. And then you guys play like how you played the lanes and then let's go over to lane two where it's fresh and let's do it the way that I think that might help you play the lane. So this is the way our team played it. This is kind of looking at your, your individual bowler strategies. I think because you guys can kind of play here, you know, Cortez is a high rev rate guy. Like he's, he's got rev rate for days. I am not a high rev rate guy. I do not have rev rate for days anymore. So for him to be able to play straighter, yeah, it's not going to be his comfort zone, but that's what we needed to do to break the lanes down. And then as the lanes got broke down, I move a little left. I'm not as good at it, but they're easier for me to move left and allow it to come back to the pocket. And so somebody like a Brian O'Keefe and myself, we were just like hanging on for a ride after that. Cause once you get out of our little area, then you were into the, you know, Kyle Barnes and the Cortez shank area where that's you move left and you kind of hook it. So getting your team together to find out each player's strengths and weaknesses uh, is a huge thing because I think like Cortez said, when you go there and you get out there and you throw the first shot and it goes runaway Brooklyn, your first instinct for majority of bowlers is to move left. That's what everybody wants to do is move left and give myself more room. That's great, but you don't realize that the lane is going to transition. It's going to blend out. Just, just stay the course. Keep your game plan in. So I think when you could get a whole team in here and you could say, I know that that went high. Don't worry about it. Just keep throwing shots there and get some oil down the lane. And then when people, we can walk people down there and show them that oil is down the lane. And this is what happens at your nationals. This is what happens at your tournaments where you feel like you struggle you're seeing that the balls are transferring oil down the lane. And the beauty of this place is we can just walk you down to the side and show it to you. Like here, this is what it looks like where there's oil down there. So, you know, I think more people than not, at least seems with bowling are visually, you know, learn visually. So if they can see what their ball does and then see the difference between doing it one way versus doing the other way, I think that would help them out. So, um, you know, please, if anybody has any questions, obviously feel free to reach out to us um, and we'll have uh, – all of our handles, but if it's B3 performance, uh, if you Google that, you'll be able to find everything for us. And uh, like I said, I know TurboTech is running stuff. I know Bowler IQ up in Detroit also. Uh, Cliff is doing stuff up there. So I think that this, this type of facility is going to be the way of the future. I think, you know, our sport needs this for the people that are, that want to keep going to nationals, that want to keep bowling the masters because, you know, Knowledge is power, and and you just – the bowling centers do what they do, and that's fine, and Bolero has done a fairly good job at doing that, and now we need to go to the next level because, you know, you get – in any other sport, there is these type of facilities that, you know, guys and girls go to to become the next level, whatever that is, uh, baseball, basketball, football. So I think that that's what we need in the sport too – uh, just to get people with some information and then so you can physically see it because sometimes it's hard to do it at a bowling center, but you got to get out and you got to, you got to have a game plan. And I think that open championships from my debacle at 1400 or whatever I shot my first year, which was not what Cortez shot um, versus, you know, bowling good last year, which was my high. I think um, it, the thing I learned is, is game plan. I knew exactly where, uh, we were going to play and we all followed that game plan and, you know, we were successful. And I think that's the the big thing that I would say to teams is trust your trust your teammate, trust your partner, trust your friend, um, because that's what Nationals is about camaraderie and, and, you know, hopefully walking out of there with a bird. That's the that's the good thing. Uh, Cortez, you've had the uh, opportunity to bowl in the greatest team environment potentially that there is team USA and junior team USA and found success on the big stages there. Any final advice for the bowlers at home again, just uh, based on that uh, and not necessarily putting together the most talent, but being able to work together and communicate and, and enjoy the experience certainly takes some of the pressure off as well. Definitely. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I hear all the time from like 
other like collegiate bowlers and so that when they are like their memories are revolve around like you know hanging out with each other and like the camaraderie and not necessarily like the bowling like the bowling's great and it's, it's fun to win and some of that but the moments you remember are the moments you're gonna have with your teammates and your partners and collaborating and just having fun together enjoying the moment um so i think that's like again one of the biggest things is when you go out there have fun um even if you're not bowling that well take it as a learning experience and then next year you know make some adjustments move on and uh you know try to improve your score you know it's it's not the end of the world one tournament doesn't define you one game doesn't define you so you know, we've all been there we've all had those times where we didn't perform um as well as we would like to um but you know just have fun take it um as what it is and just learn from it and enjoy it all right well a lot of great advice and insight today again mike calderon and cortez shank uh, from b3 performance in arizona uh, so much information, folks, but as we get closer now, the Open Championship starting uh, in less than eight weeks. May 1st is opening day. We'll go all the way until July. Plenty of time to get ready. Uh, we learned some key things today. Really, uh, first is to go out there and, and practice your spares. Make those spares, uh, especially on the challenging conditions. Uh, very, very important. Uh, understand your equipment and try to challenge yourself on finding those more difficult conditions, the sport patterns. Uh, go out, talk to your local bowling center, see what they're able to do for you to help you get ready. Uh, it might take a little bit of a drive or commitment, but, but it all should pay off once you get to the South Point Bowling Plaza and Bowling Center and put all of those new skills to the test. Uh, again, if you missed any of today's show, go back, take a listen. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Mike or Cortez or find a USBC certified coach or training center in your area to go out there, put in the work, and you'll see it translated uh, on the scoreboard and hopefully in the bank account when it's all over. But uh, that is going to do it for today's milestone episode of Inside the OC, episode number 50. And uh, we're ready to start counting down the days to opening day. Uh, coming up later in the week, Bowling Explained with Jason Thomas and Tom Frenzel. And then we'll be back here uh, on Bull TV for Inside the OC coming up again next Monday, new day and time. So check that out. Uh, Mike and Cortez, we definitely really appreciate uh, everything that you brought to the show today. And uh, I look forward to stopping through uh, as I'm driving to Las Vegas in a couple of weeks. Uh, get, my, get my lesson, get my arsenal ready as well uh, for uh, my, I think it's my 22nd year at the OC and uh, always looking to improve. So I uh, appreciate uh, everything you guys have been able to offer today, guys. Uh, and folks at home, uh, you know the drill. That's the news for now. We'll see you on the lanes. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.